with me that it's good to be here tonight. I know it's good to see each and every one of you. It's good to see that we have visitors with us tonight. And as always, if you're visiting, we're thankful for your presence. We always encourage you to come back and be with us as we meet here during the week, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Of course, we have Bible classes for all ages. We'd love to see everyone at that time also. Well, this morning we began a series in Nehemiah. Tonight we will conclude a series. Remember, this series has been entitled, Why Some Do Not Grow Weary. Some simply will not grow weary. And there are many, many Bible reasons for that. And that's what we've been suggesting in this series. Now, notice again the keynote passages for this series. Galatians 6 and verse 9. Read this with me and let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. So do not grow weary while doing good. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 13. Again, Paul says, but as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Well, in this series, we have thus far stated about 15 different points. Tonight, we'll add more points to those, but here were your suggestions. Three of you said, here's some reasons why we will not grow weary. We tried to tailor these just to make it in one statement, but because of the love of our Christian family, we mentioned that last time. What a great point. Let the love of the brethren continue, Hebrews 13 and verse 1. And so here's one of the reasons why we will not grow weary, why we do not grow weary. Because we have brothers and sisters in Christ who care about us, who will be with us during these difficult times. Again, another reason, because we are devoted, not distracted. And one of the verses mentioned was 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And so why will we not grow weary? Because we are to be devoted and not distracted. This last one, because we're here to stay in spite of problems. Ralph noted that there will be problems. In spite of those problems, we will not grow weary. You remember in John 16 and verse 33, in the world you will have tribulation. Be of good courage, I have overcome the world. And so again, in spite of problems, we will not grow weary. We're here to stay in Christ. Again, let's go right now to the points that we'll be making tonight. We have six points. We're going to go relatively quick. Sometimes I say that. And Julie says, I wish you wouldn't say it because then we belabor some of the points. Tonight we're not going to. Six more points. We've had 15 points thus far regarding why we will not lose heart, why we will not grow weary. We're going to end up tonight with 21 points. And as the proverbial statement suggests, it doesn't touch the hem of the garment. As you read and study the Bible, you know this. On every page, you're going to find reasons why we should not, why we must not grow weary. And so look at this first one here, because this is what God desires. We just read his desire in Galatians 6 and verse 9, 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 13, that we not grow weary in doing good, in well-doing. This is what God desires. And again, our attitude always should be, I want to desire what he desires. That's what we all want. We want to desire what he desires. You remember 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4? You remember in that context what he says, who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That's what God desires. He wants us to be saved. 
He wants us to continue in well-doing. You remember the negative of that. In 2 Peter 3, in verse 9, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come unto repentance. And so once again, we want to desire what he desires. We want to demand of ourselves what he demands of us. We want to delight in what he delights. And so again, because this is what God desires, make no mistake about it, as we read and study the Bible, as we apply these truths to our lives, he says, do not grow weary. He does not desire that for us. And if we desire what he desires, we will not grow weary in well-doing. Look at this next point. Number 17, because this world has absolutely nothing to offer. You remember in John 6, many withdrew and were following him no more. And Jesus turned the disciples, will you also go away? And remember Peter's response, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. The world doesn't have the words of eternal life. The world has nothing for us. And we should know that. Again, why will we not grow weary? Because this world has absolutely nothing to offer. Think about this. You know, in Luke 15, isn't this what the prodigal found out? There was a time, of course, he didn't believe this. There was a time in his life he thought the world had everything to offer him. And so he leaves his father's house. He takes that share with him. And he squanders it in loose and riotous living. But the story doesn't end there. It doesn't end in the far distant country. In the pig's pen, he comes to his senses. He came to understand this right here. That this world really has absolutely nothing to offer us. So he goes back to the Father. You know how that story ends. A glorious ending. And so this world has nothing to offer. Again, Satan has nothing to offer. He will try to make an offer. He will try to deceive. He cannot deliver, though. And keep that in mind about Satan. He will try to deceive. He will not deliver on any of his promises. He can't. By his very nature, he's a liar. The truth is not in him. John 8 and verse 44. But as we point to this positively, Christ has everything to offer. That's why we will not grow weary. That's why we will not lose heart. That's why we will not turn back and go back to those weak and beggarly elements of the world, Galatians 4 and verse 9. Christ has everything to offer us. You remember in Hebrews, the eighth chapter, listen to this verse. Now, we're going to use it a little bit differently, but the application still, think about this. Hebrews 8 and verse 3, listen to what the Hebrew writer says concerning Jesus. It says, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. Well, the Hebrew writer is just making a point upon what he's been stressing. Jesus Christ is our high priest. Priests have to have something to offer. Hence, it's necessary for this one to have something to offer. And remember now in the book of Hebrews, what he offers is himself. He does not offer the blood of bulls and goats. We're told in the book of Hebrews, they could never take away sin. He makes a one time for all sin offering. It's himself. Again, we look at this. Again, Christ has everything to offer us. He offered up himself. Remember John 10 and verse 11. I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Not only did he offer himself, but as we think about applying these truths, he's offered us contentment. He's offered us peace. He's offered us forgiveness. He's offered us reconciliation. He has everything to offer us. You remember what Jesus says to the church at Laodicea? They said, of course, in Revelation 3 and verse 17, we're rich, we're wealthy, we're in need of nothing. 
Jesus shows how ridiculous that observation was. He says, you don't even know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Then he says, come and buy from me gold refined by fire. What's his point? I have everything to offer you. I have everything and I'm willing to offer it to you. And so once again, why some will not grow weary, why they do not grow weary? Well, these two reasons, because this is what God desires and we want to desire what he does. And because this world has absolutely nothing to offer. If we're going to grow weary, if we lose heart, where are we going to go? And there's only one place to go back to. And it's the world that we left. It's the world that we understood. This has nothing to offer me. Well, look at the next point. Because salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. This is why we will not grow weary. This is why we will not lose heart. Because salvation is nearer now. You remember the scripture that was read? Turn with me, if you will, to Romans, the 11th chapter. Mickey read, or Romans 13, Mickey read Romans 13, beginning in verse 11, going through verse 14. We just want to emphasize Romans 13 and verse 11. Look at Romans 13 and verse 11. And again, remember this point. Why we will not grow weary? Why we will not lose heart? Well, very simple reason. Salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Some in the audience have been a Christian for five years, some 10, some 15, some 20, some even longer than that. And we've been running that Christian marathon, that Christian race, Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. And now we are nearer the goal than ever before. Why would we ever think about stopping? Why would we quit the race when it's so near at this time? And so look what Paul says in Romans 13 and verse 11. He says, And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Now look at his point. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Now, he says, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. You remember what? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul is talking in physical language, comparing once again our Christian life, the Christian walk, to that race that we run. And and listen to 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24. He says, do you not know that, that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you might win. Well, you see, that's what we're doing when we realize this. We're not going to grow weary because we're running in such a way as to win. We're not going to lose heart because salvation, our eternal salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. You know what's so sad? You think about some who stop living the Christian life. And possibly they've lived it for a long time. And then they meet their demise. They stopped before the race was over. They ran most of their life as a Christian and then left the Lord and left the church. I can't think of anything sadder than that. And so once again, because salvation is nearer than when we first believed... Point number 19, because of the hope of heaven. This alone is reason enough not to grow weary, not to lose heart. Because of the hope of heaven. You remember in Colossians 1 and verse 5, that's what Paul says. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Listen to what the Bible says in Hebrews 11. In verse 16, the Hebrew writer says, They desire a better country that is in heavenly. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, and he has prepared a city for them. Here it is again, the hope of heaven. 
Notice also in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 1, Paul says, For we know if this earthly tent which is our house be torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In Psalm 73 and verse 24, With thy counsel thou wilt guide me, and afterwards receive me unto glory. One last verse concerning this, Matthew 5 and verse 12. Jesus says, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And so why we will not grow weary? Because of the hope of heaven. I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed. Romans 8 and verse uh, verse, well, <laughs> somebody help me out here. Romans 8 and verse 18. Number 20, look at this. Because we want to hear well done. Now, let's do this. Take your Bibles. Turn with me to Matthew 25. This is where this context, this statement comes from. You remember we're looking at the five-talent man, the two-talent man, the one-talent man. And the five-talent man, the two-talent man, they're going to be hearing, well done. That's what we want to hear, do we not, after this life is over? We serve a God who's not afraid to say, well done. He's not ashamed to commend those that expend their energy in His cause for Him with the right motivation, with the proper love. And so look, if you will, at Matthew 25, because when we look at this, this is what we want to hear. We see there are those who are going to hear this. Pick this up with me, if you will. In Matthew 25, let's just start in verse 14 and read this with me. Notice what it says. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on, his, uh, went on a journey. Then he who had received five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money." Now, these first few verses tell us, here's what happened. In a nutshell, here's what happened. The five-talent man gained five more. The two-talent man gained two more. The one-talent man, he went and dug in the ground. He just went and hid his master's talent. The talent here represents a sum of money, not ability. Now, they were given that talent, they were given the sum of money according to their ability. So these two are closely tied together. But they were given something, something to use, something to trade, something to employ in the service of their master. Two of them did that, one of them didn't. Well, look what goes on now. Look, if you will, uh, in verse 19. It says, After a long time the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Notice that, well done. That's what each and every one of us, I believe, want to hear. Well done. So the five-talent man heard that. Well done. You're a faithful. You're a faithful servant. Look what it goes on to say. In verse 22, He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Now it's important to keep in mind here that these first two, the five-talent man, the two-talent man, 
They both pleased their master. That's important. It's a simple point, but it's important because this next man is going to imply that I couldn't please you, that no one can please you. Well, of course, it's just a lie, isn't it? The first two have pleased this man. He's not impossible to please. He's not impossible to get along with. But look what it goes on to say here. It says, verse 24, Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. Now you notice, every one of them said, look. Every one of them said, look. Look, you have what's yours. Look, I've added to these talents. But every one of the servants said, look. Notice what goes on to say in this context. Verse 26, But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. And then look at the conclusion to this. Therefore take the talent from him, give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he who has an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. How sad. Why some will not grow weary because they know this context. They know others just like it in the Bible. And they want to hear well done. Again, we cannot hear well done if we have not been engaged in well doing. That's impossible. And some want the impossible to happen. They don't want to serve the Lord. They don't want to be engaged in well-doing, but they fully expect on that day to hear well done. And it's simply not going to happen. You remember later on in this same context, Matthew 25? Look at two more verses with me. Look at verse 34, and then we'll drop down and read verse 41. These sort of highlight what we've just read once again in a different setting, a different little story. But it says, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And look at verse 41. Then he will also say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Again, the question is, what do we want to hear? Our Lord is not going to lie to us. Our Lord is not going to make something up that is not true. Have we been like that five-talent man? Are we like that two-talent man? Have we gone out and made two more talents, five more talents? If so, well done. Come, you who are blessed of my Father. If we've been like that one-talent man, if we're trying to blame the Master for our own laziness, then once again we're wicked. We're unprofitable. Depart from me. That's all we can ever hope to hear. That's what we will hear. And so why some will not grow weary? Because more than anything else, they don't want human accolades. They don't want people to pat them on the back and tell them how good they're doing when they know they're not serving the Lord. They want to hear from their Lord, from their master. Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you master over many things. Enter into the joy of your master. No greater words to hear. And look at this, last but not least. Notice what it says. Because you'll never regret living faithfully for Jesus. Now these are some simple points, aren't they? And I'm sure as we go through our lives as Christians, as we are tried, as we are tempted, as at times we grow weary, but we do not lose heart, we don't leave the Lord. Again, we've worked through some of these. We've thought about some of these. 
Think about this last one, because you'll never regret living faithfully for Jesus. Now, we will regret anything and everything else. If there ever is a time in our life that we grow weary in well-doing, that we lose heart and thus leave the Lord, we will regret that. Hopefully, it'll be in this life, and we'll regret it and repent of it and come back. But if not, we will certainly regret it throughout all eternity. We'll never regret living faithfully to Jesus. Think about just a couple of thoughts here. In Matthew 26 and verse 8, you remember this story concerning Mary and the ointment? And remember what the disciples said, what is the point of this waste? Well, of course, Mary has not wasted it. She anointed the Lord. But I do look at our lives at times, and you see people living their lives without God. You see people living their lives in opposition to His will. And you have to ask yourself the question, what's the point of all this waste? Here's a soul that is going to be lost. What shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his soul? What's the point of all this waste? waste. Again, we'll never regret living for Jesus. We won't regret it in this life. We certainly will not regret it on the day of judgment. And we certainly will never live to regret it throughout all eternity. You remember Philippians 1 and verse 21? Paul said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What a gain we have in Christ, both in this life and in the life to come. Brethren, again, as we've studied together, as we've encouraged each other, let us not grow weary in well-doing, for we shall reap if we faint not. Again, let's continue serving the Lord. Let's continue being faithful to Him. Let's continue growing in His grace and in His knowledge. You remember 2 Peter 3, verses 17 and 18, Do not fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Appreciate y'all being so attentive throughout this series. Also issuing for me some of the, your own points. Let's continue to think about this. We might be through with this series, but hopefully we're not through thinking about this. The more we ponder this, the more we look at this, the more we go through the Bible and say, here's another reason. It fortifies our faith. It strengthens us in Christ Jesus. It makes us where we can resist the devil and have him flee from us. James 4. Verses 7 and 8. My friend, tonight, if you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, our question is a simple one. Why not? Why not? You stand to lose too much by never obeying the Christ. Simply the joy here in this life, but also the joy throughout all eternity. And brothers and sisters in Christ, are we growing are we maturing? Are we deepening in those things spiritual? Do we understand why we will not grow weary? Have we set our hearts? Have we purposed our hearts? That whatever happens in this life, we're not going to be tempted to leave the Lord because we know where we are. We know who we're serving. We know the blessings that He has given us. If you have a spiritual need in your life tonight, then won't you come and express it before the congregation here? If you need to be restored to your first love, let's take care of that tonight. If you need to be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, you've heard the gospel story before. You know concerning Christ and His sacrifice for you. You understand that you have sinned and that He is the sacrifice for that sin. You believe in Him. You're willing to confess Him. You're willing to repent of your sins and to be baptized into Him. 
Won't you come tonight and take care of these spiritual matters before it's too late? If you're willing, if you're ready, if you need to, won't you come as we stand and as we sing?